27 game-changing worship leading tips as fast as possible to help you lead worship well. Let's go. The first is this, open your eyes. Quit leading with your eyes closed all the time. We need to have our eyes open so that we can see the people that we're leading and engage them in worship. When you look at people, you are connecting with them. And the reason that we worship together is so that we can connect with other people. We aren't just here to have our own personal times of worship. We are here to connect with other people. One of the ways you do that is by opening your eyes and looking at them. Also, opening your eyes allows you to gauge the room, seeing where people are at, and navigating them according to where they're at and not just guessing when your eyes are closed the whole time and then you open up and you realize that nobody was even paying attention for the last five minutes or they were distracted by something. So open your eyes. Number two, actually prepare your transitions. It's so easy to get lazy in our worship leading transitions where we're like, I'll just figure it out in the moment. Either number one, because we don't know how to transition between songs, so we just ignore it and hope that it'll work itself out in the first place. Or you, maybe you're on the other end of the spectrum and you've been leading worship for 20 years and you're like, you know what, I've been doing this for 20 years, so I know how to transition between songs. So I'll just figure it out in the moment because I can do that. No, take the time to plan out your transitions. Planning out your transitions is just as important as actually learning the musical side of the song. So think to yourself, what am I gonna say between these songs, if anything at all? And more importantly, how am I going to eliminate any dead air between the songs in my set list and the different elements in my service so that I can create the smoothest transitions possible so that people don't get distracted by moments of prolonged, unnecessary silence. Number three, listen, this one is a game changer. I always get pushed back on this one, but memorize your music. If you wanna improve your worship leading, one of the best ways you can do it is to memorize your music because, not because I think you need to memorize your music because you look unprofessional on stage whenever you're staring at your music stand the entire time. I want you to memorize your music because then you'll actually know your music, which will free you up to focus on the spiritual side of leading worship. Leading worship is not just a musical thing that we do. We aren't just up there to read the chords off of a chord chart with our head down the whole time and play every note exactly correct. Hopefully you play every note correctly, but whenever you have it memorized and you know it by heart, you don't even, you get to a place where you don't even have to think about your music anymore and you can just play it which means your mind isn't thinking, okay, I need to go from a G to a C. Wait, there's an E minor coming up on the chord chart here, so let's go to an E minor. That thought process just falls into the back of your mind and you start to feel the music that you're playing and then that frees you up to actually lead the people in front of you. And you can think, okay, that person in the front row, they're not connecting right now. What's going on in their lives? How can I lead them to encounter God in these moments? How can I help them navigate around the barriers that are keeping them from doing that? Number four, coordinate with your pastor. We don't have to Bob Ross our worship services and have everything be a happy accident when the song coming out of the message magically lines up with the message. And it was like, oh, the Holy Spirit was working today because my pastor and I, we didn't even talk at all. And did you hear how he preached about this? And I sang about this and it was the perfect match. We don't make mistakes. We have happy accidents. So today, let's have a happy accident and see what we can make out of it. Well, if that's such an amazing thing that you want to happen, and it's awesome when you and your pastor don't coordinate at all, why don't you just coordinate with your pastor and make it happen every single week? That's what we should be doing as a worship leader is talking to our pastor and making sure that us and our pastor have a common vision for where the church is headed on a Sunday morning so that we can support the same themes and reinforce them. Don't Bob Ross your worship service. Don't let it be a happy accident. Just plan it in advance. Number five, and I know this one seems like a little fluffy when you hear it at first and it's like, okay, yeah, I already know that. But number five is read your Bible and pray daily. And honestly, this is something we know that Christians, every Christian should be doing. But especially as leaders in the church, we need to fill our well up so that we have something to pour out of. But that's not even just the reason that we did it. I think I operated from this idea for a long time that I need to be reading the Bible and praying every day so that when I get on stage, I'll have something to say. But whenever you get on stage, Yes, what you do in private will come out in public. So it helps you whenever you're on stage. But this tip is literally 
not even really a worship leading tip, I guess. It's more for your soul. Like if you are not connected with the word of God, with God, not just the word of God, but God himself through his word and through prayer on a daily basis, you're going to burn out. You're going to be tired. You're going to just compartmentalize your life where worship is just something that you do at church. Just get in the word and pray every single day. I've talked about this before. Set a timer for 15 minutes and try to pray for those 15 minutes. If you want more information about that, I'll link a video about that down in the description below that I made. But just set that timer for 15 minutes. Commit to reading one chapter of the Bible a day. If that's all you can do at the beginning, God would be so honored in you doing that. So just do it and feed yourself before you lead others. Number six, before you lead worship, you need to ask yourself this question. What does my church need to sing this Sunday? Not what do I want to sing? Not what does my pastor want me to sing? But what does my church need to sing? And this is going to help you plan songs that your church actually engages with. All too often, we plan worship sets in isolation and we're like, I heard this song on the radio and I really liked it and so I'm going to do it. Or I really like this John Mark McMillan song but it probably wouldn't work in my church, but I'm gonna do it anyways because I love John Mark McMillan. Been there plenty of times before. So we need to have a thought process, a filter where it's not just about us and the perfect way to filter that into actually leading our church is by asking the question, what does my church need to sing this Sunday? Think about what's going on in the lives of your people. What truth do they need to hear about God and respond to together? Number seven, implement a countdown at the beginning of your service. This is something that I didn't have for the longest time and I was always super angry because people were out in the lobby talking and they wouldn't come in to the service until like halfway through the second song. Literally the solution to that problem that I found was primarily starting on time every time during your service, but utilizing a countdown to support that idea that you're gonna start on time every single time. And so what I do now is I have a countdown queued up in pro presenter and i've got it scheduled so our service starts at 10 55 which i know is a weird time but that's when our service starts so at 10 50 pro presenter automatically triggers a five minute countdown and i know when i see that pop up on the screen man i better get prepared to go on stage. I don't even know if I have time to go to the bathroom beforehand sometimes. And so I get up on stage and I plug in and I'm ready to go. And people see that on the screens and they know, okay, Spencer has started the service on time every time for the past six years. And so we're gonna start on time, so I better get in there. So implement a countdown into your worship leading. I'll even link a free one down in the description below that you can use if you don't have one. Number eight, let other people lead. Listen, this is something that I've struggled with in the past before. I've been leading worship for 16 years, and so it's really hard to let somebody who's been leading worship for like six months lead a song, because let's just be honest, like I'm not the best worship leader in the world. By no means am I the best singer. By no means am I the best worship leader in the world. But let's just be honest, there's a difference between somebody who's lead been leading for 16 years and somebody who's been leading for six months. There's an experience gap there, right? And so it's hard whenever you've been leading that long, you do things a certain way, you've set the expectation somewhere in your church, and probably the pe person who hasn't been leading that long isn't going to live up to that expectation. But part of developing leaders in the church is setting them loose. It's saying, you know, you're probably not quite there yet, but you need experience. So let other people lead and start utilizing p other leaders in your church. If you have somebody who's been singing background for the past five years, give them a chance to lead a song, even if you don't think that they're quite ready yet, because they're only going to get ready, not before they actually lead. They're only going to get ready by getting those repetitions in of actually leading a song. And you know what? The first time might not be up to the standard that you hoped it would be. But I guarantee if you let them do it for six months, they're gonna get there. So just trust the process. And what that does is that frees you up then to focus on other aspects of the worship service because now instead of having to learn five songs, maybe you only have to learn three songs and you can use that time that you would have used to learn those extra two songs to work on your speaking transitions or improve your prayers or think about the transitions between songs. So let other people lead with you. Maybe you're thinking to yourself though, you know what? I don't have anybody to join my worship team. Well, number nine is this 
ask someone to join your worship team. And I know what you're thinking, like, Spencer, there's nobody in my church to, to lead with me. I've tried it before. I've put the announcement up on the screen, and guess what? Nobody responded. I said, talk to me after the service, and nobody came up. Well, maybe the problem was is that the best way to find people for your worship team is to get to know the people of your church and then go and personally ask people who would be a good fit for your team. That is what people are waiting for. People are not gonna respond most of the time to an announcement on the screen. That doesn't mean that we shouldn't do it. I still think it's valuable to put it up there just in case. But the majority of your worship leading leads will come from you going out into your church and finding people and asking them, hey, I heard you played guitar five years ago. Do you still play? Well, yeah, I do play sometimes. Okay, do you wanna try? joining the worship team and like hanging out with us at a couple rehearsals and rekindling that old guitar playing passion. You know, that's how you grow your worship team is going out and finding people. So go ask them. That is the best way to find people for your worship team. Number 10, do you want your church to sing out more? Well, how about you lower the song keys? All too often we put the keys of our songs up way too high. What is that? Maybe you're not like, maybe you've been doing some Chris Tomlin songs and you're like, I can't even sing that high. So you bring it down like a step. Well, you probably need to bring it down like two steps because Chris Tomlin sings really high. So if you want a rule of thumb for this, I like to keep my songs between a low B flat and at the upper end, a high E flat. Now on the guitar, that is the first fret of the A string on the low end, and then on the high end, it is the eighth fret of the G string. So if you keep your melody in between those, then that will be a singable key for your congregation. There's a little bit more to it than that, so I will link a video down in the description below about how to put your songs in a singable key, but that's the general principle. And what that's going to allow the people in your church to do is, first of all, the people in your church are not professional singers. Maybe you aren't a professional singer either, but you're at least adequate enough to be on stage leading the songs. That only described like 20% of your church, if that. Most people cannot sing as high as you can because they're not used to singing all the time. So lower the keys and more people will be able to sing out and more importantly, engage vocally in worship. Speaking of getting people to sing along with you, maybe one of the reasons that people aren't singing along with you is because of number 11, and that is that you need to stop introducing so many new songs. How often do you introduce a new song at your church? I think a lot of people have a rhythm of like once a month at their church, which I think that's a good rhythm. That's, for my church, I feel like that's still a little bit too fast for them. Of course, you have to know your church. Some churches learn songs faster than other churches. But if you're doing like a new song like every week or every other week just because you can, first of all, your worship team's not gonna be able to learn songs well that quickly. That's a lot to ask of your worship team, especially if you're in a smaller church and people don't have the commitment that maybe a larger church would be able to have. So. Stop introducing so many songs from that perspective. I mean, think about your worship team. You're sending it out in advance so that they can learn it before rehearsal, and then you go through it a couple times at rehearsal, and then you go through it before the service, and then they finally lead it on Sunday. Like, they've probably played and heard the song, like, maybe 10 times before they actually lead it on Sunday, but the people you're leading in your church have only heard it one time. And most people don't come to church every single Sunday, so if they weren't there for that week, then they haven't heard it. So just stop introducing so many songs. Pull back a little bit. It's okay to sing the songs that you've sung for the past two years over and over again. It actually helps people engage in worship because they actually know the songs that you're singing. Number 12, a quick guitar tip for all you guitar players. Don't worry if you don't play guitar, I'll make this quick. But if it's just you playing an acoustic guitar, one of my favorite tricks to do is to take your trusty old Kaiser capo, instead of putting it on this way on the second fret, take that and turn it around, put it on backwards, and leave that open E string open right here. Don't cover that up and then play D chords and you get this nice full sound. As opposed to. Hear the difference when we open it up to.
So mess around with that. Number 12, just one more quick guitar tip for you. If you have two acoustic guitarists on your team, never have them playing the same chord shapes. For example, if you're playing a song in the key of C, I can't stand it when I see worship teams playing a song in the key of C and they have two acoustic guitars and they're playing the same exact thing and it sounds like this. Why do I not like that? Well, it's because you've got two people playing the same exact thing and it doesn't sound good, it muddies the musical waters when you're playing the same thing. So the easy fix for that is to take your capo, if you're in the key of C, put it on the fifth fret and start playing G chords along with that, which you're still in the key of C now, but we're playing G shapes. We're up higher on the guitar neck. So you're gonna hear the separation here between the two guitars and it creates a more full sound. It sounds like this. So never, I repeat, never have two acoustic guitarists playing the same exact chord shapes, the same exact strum pattern. It just muddies the waters and you can make a much better sound if you separate them a little bit by simply adding a capo and playing different chord shapes. Now, before we go any further, I just want to point out that these are a lot of tips, right? Like there are a ton of tips in this video and I've got a bunch more to come, but I want to give you something tangible to do so that this isn't just information, it actually becomes action. And that's why I've linked down in the description below a free audio training I put together called five tips to instantly improve your worship leading a few more tips but I think that these that I talk about in the audio training are the most actionable worship leading tips that you can take you can do them all before this Sunday and you will instantly improve your worship leading so check that out in the description below number 14 start planning your services out in advance if this isn't something that you normally do aim for like a week out in advance. Like Monday, you should be thinking about what you're going to do on Sunday. I've heard it called before like the Saturday night special. I think they were talking more about like a pastor who hasn't prepared a sermon, so they just open up their Bible and then throw something together on Saturday night. We don't want to do that as worship leaders either. We want to give ourselves at least a week because when we give ourselves a week, it allows the ideas that we have to marinate, or I like to call it like the slow cooker theory where we have these thoughts in our minds, we're thinking about the worship set, we're letting it stew in our brain and it gets better. The longer it cooks. So if we only give it 12 hours to cook or two days to cook, it's not going to taste as good as if we gave it a week to cook. So start planning things out at least a week in advance. I know a lot of people do it even further out in advance than that. I also know that a lot of you are volunteer worship leaders who don't have the time to do that. So I think if you aim to start planning on Monday, after you led on Sunday, plan for the next Sunday, starting on that Monday, and then maybe send out the songs on Tuesday at the latest. I think that that's a good rhythm to be in if you've never thought about planning in advance before. Another benefit of planning in advance is actually tip number 15, which is it gives you time to worship through your set list. You see, when you don't plan in advance, you just hope like, okay, I hope that I can play these songs musically, and you spend your time preparing, learning them musically, but we know, as I've said before, worship leading is not just a musical act, it is a spiritual responsibility, and if we only ever focus on the musical side, then we're never gonna be able to focus on the spiritual side, and the spiritual side happens once we have the musical side down. So once you have the musical side down because you've planned in advance and you've already learned your songs, take the time to worship through your set list. From beginning to end, treat it like you would during a service, and do it, number one, for yourself, just as a an excuse not that we need an excuse, but as an excuse to worship God and just worship him and see what comes out. And that will give you, give you revelation into how you should be leading your church on Sunday because you've already gone on the journey of worship through your set list before you ever lead your church on that journey. Number 16, watch other churches' live streams. If you feel like you're stuck in your worship leading, one of the best ways to break out of that rut is to attend another church, but usually as worship leaders, we can't attend another church because we're leading on Sundays, but 
now pretty much everybody's church live streams because of COVID and what happened over the past few years. And the benefit of that is that we can now see what other churches are doing. And we don't do it so that we can compare ourselves to them. We do it to get inspired by what they're doing and maybe celebrate what they're doing and maybe think, okay, that was really cool for their church. How can I pull that into my context? Would this work in my context? And whenever you watch other churches' live streams, you're going to get so many ideas for speaking transitions, new songs, maybe a different order for your service, but you're not going to think about those things if you are only stuck in your own church every single Sunday doing the things that you've always done. So if you want to break out of your creative rut, check out some other churches' live streams. Now, maybe if you're stuck in a creative rut, you feel stuck in your worship leading, part of the problem might be number 17, and that is that you just need to take a break. When was the last time you actually had a sustained break from worship leading? Not like one Sunday off, but like a Sunday and a week off at least. If it's been more than a year, then you definitely need to schedule a Sunday off. People don't like when I talk about this because we think that we can just push on and on forever, but I would just say shortly, you cannot push on and on forever. You will burn out at some point. So we need a regular rhythm of rest, but it starts just by making the commitment right here, right now, look out three months in advance if you feel overwhelmed by the idea of taking a Sunday off and write in your calendar on a Sunday, I won't be here at church this week. And then work with your pastor and other leaders in your church to figure out how those responsibilities are going to be fulfilled because you are important to your church, but you aren't that important to your church. And I want you to hear that very carefully, what I mean by that. I mean, you are important to your church, so you need to take a week off so you don't burn out, but you aren't that important to your church where you can't ever take a week off. All right, your church's foundation is not built on you. It's built on Jesus and the Spirit of God. And there are other people in your church who can step up or people from outside of the church, from a different church who can come in and support what's happening at your church so that you can have a break, so that you can lead for many, many years to come. So schedule a week off. Number 18, learn the Nashville number system. I talked about at the beginning of this video about memorizing your music. If you wanna memorize your music, this is the best way to do it. I won't take time to explain the Nashville number system here. I've already made it a lengthy video on that, which you can check out in the description below. But the Nashville number system is a lifesaver. It will help you memorize your music because you'll be able to see the patterns of the chords in the music. It'll help you transpose music. So whenever you show up and you realize that that a song key is too high, you can instantly transpose the song down a step or two so that you can actually sing the song. There's just so many benefits to the Nashville number system. So check out that video in the description below if you haven't learned that yet and definitely learn the Nashville number system. Number 19, when you are arranging your worship songs, just copy the original arrangement. I know it's so tempting to try to put a spin on things ourselves, but the closer you can copy the original arrangement of the song, the better it will be. Now, I understand that you might not always have the instrumentation to do that, depending on what the original arrangement is, but find alternative arrangements, maybe. Check out worshiptogether.com, where they do like those, uh, what do they call them now? Like They used to call them new song cafes. I don't know if they have a name like that anymore, but there's always these acoustic versions on Worship Together, so check those acoustic versions out and copy those arrangements. And the reason that we do that is because we don't need to reinvent the wheel. We don't need to create a new arrangement arrangement. Producers were paid a good amount of money to produce these songs, at least I assume they were. Producers were paid a good amount of money to produce these songs, and they're professionals at it. They know how instruments work together and vocal parts work together. So we can just take that as a gift and use it and then our songs will instantly sound better when we realize that our guitarist doesn't need to play for the entire time or our piano doesn't need to be all over the keyboard doing a million things. They can just do like a simple bass note in the left hand and like just a repeating pattern in the right hand up high on the keyboard. Copy the original arrangement. Number 20, if you wanna lead your people better on Sundays, we have to get to know them outside of Sunday morning. One of the biggest complaints I hear from worship leaders is that I can't connect with the people of my church on Sunday mornings, and I look out and everybody seems disengaged. But 
the reality is you can't fix that instantly on a Sunday morning. There are some things that you can do to help alleviate that problem on a Sunday morning, but the primary work happens outside of Sunday morning, where you are no longer just the worship leader who gets on stage and sings a couple songs and speaks into a microphone, but you are now that guy or that girl who asked them, hey, do you want to get a cup of coffee and talk about life this week? And you get with them outside of a Sunday morning, or maybe you attend a small group that they go to, and you just get to know people outside of Sunday morning. That will help you lead them so much better when Sunday morning comes. Number 21, start using this, a pad. I've talked about this a million times on my channel now because I really believe in it, but I won't belabor the point. If you don't know what a pad is, it's that sound right there, but also check out down in the description below link to a video I made about my pad setup where I'll explain even more. Basically what a pad does is it fills in the sonic cracks of the sound that your band has and gives you a fuller sound. And it's just a super simple way to improve the sound quality of your worship team. Number 22, understand the goal that you have as a worship leader. What is your job as a worship leader? It is simply this, to point people to the worthiness of God and to provide them with the opportunity to respond. If you've done those two things on Sunday, you've succeeded. That doesn't rely on everybody in your church engaging in worship on a Sunday morning. You can't control that. That is the Holy Spirit's responsibility to make that happen, and it's the person's free will of making that choice to make it happen. What you can do is you can point them in the right direction to the worthiness of God. That is where the word worship comes from, from worth-ship. So we need to point people to the worthiness of God so that they have something to worship. They see a clear picture of him and then we provide the opportunity to respond. If you are doing those two things, you have fulfilled your responsibility as a worship leader. Number 23, if you want to improve your worship leading, level up your theology and you will level up your worship leading. The more you know about God, the easier your speaking transitions will be. The more specifically you'll be able to minister to the needs of your people because specific truths about God will come to mind that you can point out in their specific circumstances. There are three books that I love if you want to level up your theology. I think if you read these books, you will skyrocket in your growth as a worship leader because you'll actually understand what you're doing. The first is this. It is Worship Matters by Bob Coughlin. The second is The Pursuit of God by A.W. Tozer. If you're looking for a super simple book, that one's like six bucks. It's really thin. The chapters are really short, but there's so much packed into it. So The Pursuit of God by A.W. Tozer. And then the last one is Doxology and Theology by Matt Boswell. And he has a bunch of other people who write in that book. So check those out if you're interested in leveling up your theology. Number 24, let's take care of our voice and do some vocal warm-ups. Do you do vocal warm-ups in the car on the way? I, I gotta be honest, I don't do them all the time. I'm guilty of not doing them, but I know when I do do vocal wor warm-ups, when I do do vocal warm-ups, then man, my voice just feels so good and I feel so confident vocally when I step on stage to lead. My favorite vocal warm-ups are from Jacob's Vocal Academy. Once again, I'll link my favorite vocal warm-up. It's a 15-minute vocal warm-up. Link that down in the description below. Number 25, take Saturdays off. Hear me out on this. I know it's kind of like whenever you have like a test in school and we try to cram beforehand. That's not the way to actually prepare for the test. Not that worship leading is a test, but we do the same thing whenever it comes to worship leading. And we think, man, I need to cram everything into that Saturday before and I'm nervous. So I'm going to run through my songs a million times and practice my transitions. Listen, that's great, but you should be doing that earlier in the week and then take Saturday off so that you have a moment. Once again, that slow cooker theory that I talked about about before, crockpot theory, whatever you want to call it, where you just let your mind turn off. And that is where the long-term memory actually comes into play. It's kind of like whenever you're trying to learn something for a long time and then you can't get it down, but you go to sleep and you wake up the next morning and you finally learned it. I think the same process happens whenever we take a day off. So just take that Saturday off, trust in the preparation that you put in before Saturday, before Sunday, all week long, take Saturday off, and then come into Sunday refreshed and ready to lead. And I guarantee you will be fine if you have put in the preparation beforehand. Number 26, quit feeling the need to make every Sunday bigger and better 
than the last. I've felt this pressure so many times, especially when it comes to like Easter and Christmas. Whenever I'm planning for those, I'm like, what did we do last year? I need to do something better than what we did last year. Last year, we did a video. This year, we need to do a video and a live element. Next year, we need to do a video and a live ele element and have an elephant walk through the middle of our church. <laughs> I don't know. Like, we don't need to make every Sunday bigger and better than the last. That is a losing game. God is already infinitely great. Transformation in worship doesn't happen from constantly upping the game and trying to make things better than they were last week. Transformation in worship happens because we are in the presence of God and we are transformed by the presence of God and that happens through a prolonged staying in the presence of God because his presence is transformative. We don't have to conjure up something newer and exciting and have a donut board out in our lobby for the fathers on Father's Day. Not that there's anything wrong with that. I'm just using that in, as an example because as of me filming this video, it's gonna be Father's Day. We don't need to have that. We can have that, but don't feel the pressure to have that every single Sunday and constantly up the ante. You don't need to do that. Just point people to the worthiness of God and provide them with the opportunity to respond. Number 27, the biggest tip of all, stop facilitating personal worship moments and start facilitating corporate worship moments. When we gather as the church on Sunday, I've said this a million times on the channel, but I will repeat myself a million more times because I believe in it. When we gather on Sunday morning, our purpose is not to have our own personal times of worship in the same room with other believers. The purpose of Sunday morning worship when we gather as a church is for us to worship together. And as worship leaders, we need to highlight that idea and teach our church that because a lot of people in our church don't know that. And so we need to teach it to them by leading those moments where we say, hey, I want you to sing this song over the person beside you. Or leading a moment where you say, hey, when we sing these songs, we are reminding ourselves of the truths that we're singing, but we're also reminding the people around us of the truths that we're singing so that we can be encouraged and exhorted and admonished together and built up that is why we gather for Sunday morning worship. Now, like I said before, the, that was a lot of tips. And so I just wanna give you an actionable step to take. And so down in the description below, right at the very top, I've linked a free training that I put together called Five Tips to Instantly Improve Your Worship Leading. Those 27 tips, that was a lot. You probably can't implement all of them on Sunday, but these five tips in the Five Tips to Instantly Improve Your Worship Leading audio training, you can implement them this Sunday and they will level up your worship leading. So if you want to actually implement what you learned in this video and not just listen to a video about a bunch of tips, check out that link in the description below to that free audio training and do what it says and you will instantly improve your worship leading. Other than that, thanks so much for joining me. Until I see you in the next video, keep leading worship well.